that's the only all right um so this will be part two i think i should be able to finish this today on the uh uh, discussion of Tawheed, uh, the oneness of Allah. Now, this concept, the most important concept of Al Islam. So, we want to make sure that we understand it to the fullest extent. So, I've been, you know, communicating with people about the ancient man or the primitive man and how they understood the oneness of Allah, they didn't need all this explanation to understand it. The more we know and the more we understand, we should have more conviction and more belief in the oneness of Allah. And we should be able to understand it even more clearly. They perhaps, they didn't have as many questions as we do. There weren't as many people on the earth. There are almost 8 billion people on earth today. So different people ask different questions all the time. So. Perhaps that is the reason why it is a need for us to be to be more uh, detailed in our explanation and understanding of the oneness of Allah. Because to me, it's straightforward and simple. Um, but people have different ideas, and there is one truth, and there is an infinite uh, infinite amount of falsehood. As long as you can think of something, you can think of something that's untrue. So in order to debunk things that are untrue, there are always things that are coming up. We have to come up with more explanations and understanding to make sure the, the proper understanding is given to uh, throughout the world. Um, <clears throat> in doing that, what I want to talk about, well, I want to make sure that we understand the oneness of Allah. And the Shahadatain, I bear witness that there is no God except the law. And the second part of that is I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of the law. So the first part is the most important part of this. We're saying that there is no deity, there's no object worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People who don't understand Arabic, people who see Islam is something foreign, see the word Allah and then they have some reservations about it. They have some um, apprehensions about it. But Allah means the God. So we are saying that there is no deity, no object worthy of worship except the God. Christians who speak Arabic call God Allah. Jews who speak Arabic call God Allah. Whoever speaks Arabic and they're speaking of the one God, they call him Allah. So it is not something that should be foreign, but just because it is a word that people are unfamiliar with, sometimes they have some apprehensions. The second part of that is I bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu Wasallam is his servant and messenger. So the point of that is to say that this man is the one that conveyed this message to all of humanity. This last prophet. So he conveyed the same message that all the other prophets uh, conveyed, which was that there is one God. And that's actually something that I wanted to, that I'm going to begin with, is Dawah. Dawah means an invitation. So what we believe is that God sends revelation to a human being, the most esteemed human being. These, this person is already a good person, a good, moral, truthful person. And Allah chooses this person to deliver the message to all of mankind, particularly to his own people. And then they can convey it to whomever else. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Prophet Muhammad sallallahu as the last prophet. You have any questions? Yes, sir. So basically what you're saying, like, so the man don't, you saying, the man don't make Muslim. Allah make, makes the Muslim, basically what you're saying. Uh, that's not what I was really saying, but I don't know what you mean by the question. Maybe I should be more clear. You should. Yeah, can you explain that more to me, like? Mm -hmm. Can you explain the name? Break it down? So, the man, so Muslim, Islam means submission to the will of God. So do what Allah wants you to do. Or do what God wants you to do. So any person who is striving to do that is a Muslim. Then the second level to that is a mu'min, or one who is a believer. 
So you can be a mukmin. A mukmin is one who believes in the angels, who believes in the prophets, all the different prophets from Moses, Abraham, Jesus, all the way to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And peace be upon all those prophets. So you can be at home and think to yourself that God is the, cre is the creator and he wants me to do something. He wants me to be, to be a righteous person. So Islam gives you the directive on how you live your life, how exactly God wants you to live your life. So people throughout the world that believe in God and are striving to do what God wants them to do are, in theory, a Muslim. You become a conscious Muslim when you understand that the Quran is the words of, a God, the words of God given to you, and you should follow them. So a Christian, they believe in God. They believe that they are following the will of God. They are attempting to, in the same way Jews are, and Hindus are, and whomever else that believes in God. The difference is this is called al-Islam, meaning the submission to the will of God. It means God chose how he wants you to worship him. It's the same way as if you want to honor your mother and father. You don't honor them by doing what you want to do. You honor them by doing what they want you to do. So in the same way, Allah decides in his book, this is, or he gives his revelation to us, this is how we should live our lives. So they are attempting to it, but because they don't follow the Quran and the ways of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are not actually following the submission to the will of God or what God chose them to do. They are attempting to. So what, what Allah does is sees this person who is an honorable person, and then he chooses them to give them that revelation, and then they spread the revelation throughout, throughout the humanity. So basically, that's what the Quran is. It is, a, it is the communication from our creator to human beings on how you should live your life. Is that, did I clarify that for you? Yes, sir. All right. So when you are saying the shahadatain, when you are saying a bad witness that there is no God but Allah, you're saying Allah is, is only one God. And you're saying that the prophet is delivering the message of that one God. That's all you're saying. And he is the, so in order to make sure that he is never put in the same esteem as that God, we try to we make sure we say that he is a servant and messenger of him, meaning he's doing something for God, but he is not God himself. So with that said, every, every nation received a messenger. Allah says in the Quran, verily we have sent to every nation a messenger. Now the word that I used was dawah, meaning an invitation. So you invite people to the truth. Of revelation to the truth of al-islam what these prophets said the message that they conveyed was to worship Allah and avoid false gods that was their primary message and that is what al-islam is built upon that there is one God and then all the rest of the pillars follow in succession Aisha one of the um, wives of the prophet said that the prophet did not start dawah but by telling people to he didn't start dawah by telling people to stop drinking or start committing adultery or any of those things he started by telling them about God and the hereafter. He said if he started by telling them about wine and adultery, they would definitely say we're never going to give those things up. So that's not the succession of how you should give people an invitation to this religion. The first thing is you say is worship Allah, and then you tell them how, what Allah wants you to do in this life. Now I tell them you need to stop eating pork or what have you, because ultimately it's a succession in how you live your life. Every Muslim doesn't start the next day doing everything right. They don't start praying five times a day, doing things where they're thinking about Allah at all times, because that's what, what we are to do is to be God conscious. Taqwa means to be careful, to be thinking about God, to have God in the forefront of your mind and all of your actions. So with that said, the, the reason that I wanted to mention that is because we're talking about uh, Tawheed or the oneness of Allah, that's the first thing that every messenger conveyed, and that is why the same message of oneness of God was conveyed throughout, throughout the world. So the first people, whenever, whatever, when they received that revelation, they received the revelation of one God, and every country thereafter received that same revelation from the different messengers to each nation. So even when they traveled abroad to other places, that same message was revealed. And reading the Quran, or in reading the Quran, you see the different prophets in their same message. Talking about Noah, alayhi salam, it says, and we had certain, certainly sent Noah to his people, and he said, O oh, my people, worship Allah. You have no God other than him, then will you not fear him? Ibrahim, or Abraham, alayhi salam, says the same thing. He says, and we sent him to his people, and he said, worship Allah and fear him. 
that is best for you if you should know. You worship besides Allah only idols, and you invent, invent falsehood. Indeed, those who worship besides Allah have no power to give you provision, so seek your provision from Allah and worship him and be grateful. Ibrahim was notorious for saying, you built something with your own hands and then you worshiped it. How does that you know, make sense? And in, at any rate, you know, Ibrahim was someone who confronted people about their beliefs and said, does this make sense to you? And Hood said the same thing. And Hood went to his people and he said, oh my people, worship Allah alone. You have no God other than him then will you not fear him? Sully, alayhi salam, says the same thing when he went to the people of Thamud. He said, O my people, worship Allah alone. You have no other God but him. Shu'ed went to the people of Midian and said, O my people, worship Allah. You have no deity other than him. Yaqub, when talking to his sons to convey his message on his deathbed, he said, What will you worship after me? And they said, You will worship God and the Father and the God of your fathers, Ibrahim, Ismail, and Ishaq. The one God, to him we submit. And Isa, alayhi salam, or Jesus, said to the children of Israel, Worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord, and your Lord. Indeed he, ha indeed, he has no associates with him. Allah has forbidden anyone who associates others with him. Allah has forbidden paradise for them, and his abode is in fire. And, and Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, several times in the Quran says, Allah, do I worship? Sincere to him is my religion. So the same message was conveyed from all the prophets. The first thing that they, they established was the oneness of Allah. Worship him and no one besides him or no one with him. <clears throat> so I had been communicating with a couple of different people about um, the oneness of Allah. Someone had um, recommended this book by a man named Don Richardson. It's called The Eternity in Their, heaven, in their Hearts. Startling evidence of the belief in the one true God in hundreds of cultures throughout the world. So this man, Don Richardson, enumerated research from ancient monotheism. He lists 10 different ancient people who total 3 million men and women who all worship the one God. So the, the list of the people that he was talking about were people from ancient times. The Incans, the Santa, the Kachin, the Lahu, the Wa, the Kau, the Lisu the Naga, the Mizo, the Karim, the Karim, all of them had their one God and the name that they had given him or the attribute they had given him, whether they call him the creator of all, the true God, the supreme God, the supreme being, the, the genuine one, the Native Americans called him the great spirit. So all of them is, um, are giving a testimony to the belief in this one true God. Throughout the world, wherever you go, you find out when you go back to the, the indigenous people, they believed in one God. And ultimately today, what we have is the completion and, com and perfection of what that one God was, or what that religion was, which was Al-Islam. So what they were teaching was believe in one God and do what that God wants you to do. That is literally Al-Islam. Al-Islam means to do what Allah wants you to do. So anyone throughout history that does what Allah wants them to do is a Muslim. Whether they were here 2,000 years ago, or 6,000 years ago, or 10,000 years ago, or a million years ago. See, the thing with Al-Islam is that it is an action, right? So, as long as there are other actions, they will all, Islam will always exist. And Islam means do what God wants you to do. So, when God created the first thing and he did what he wanted you to do, it was in submission to Allah. It was in a state of Al-Islam. So the planets, the moon, the stars, the grass that grows, the ants, the mosquitoes, the bees are all in the state of Al-Islam. There is nothing that supersedes Al-Islam except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of all things. So as soon as he created something, it submitted to his will and it was in a state of Al-Islam. So when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam came, he gave the last revelation to mankind. He perfected what had been established throughout history. The same thing of one God and doing what Allah wants you to do. That's, that's what, I'm really what, what, what would be the necessity for Pak Muhammad, peace be upon him, to have been revealed this final revelation? If this is the revelation about all humanity mm -hmm. for 
thousands upon thousands of years, what would be the necessity for him to have to receive this perfection of the religion? I think, again, let me start off by saying that this is my opinion. That's why I'm starting off with what I think. So as man evolved um, and became more knowledgeable, became more inquisitive, the religion had to be completed just as huma humanity was. I don't think it's a coincidence that we are in a time of literacy and a time of printed work when we have a religion and we have a revelation that is constant, that stays the same because the revelation previously was oral. So ultimately it was designed for it to be forgotten. It wasn't in designed for it to last for eternity and it was for particular groups. When we look at the children of Israel, for example, or you can think about any people, any, any people at, at one point, if they're in one society and then they travel to another society, their rules would begin to change. For example, the reason I want to mention the children of Israel is because I'm more familiar with them. So if they're a nomadic people, their religion or their laws would be for swift justice. So when someone commits a crime, someone steals, cut their hand off, or someone does something to you, it's an I-49, two for two. And then we have Isa alayhi salam, you can tell it's a progression. He's saying, have some compassion in the laws. Don't just take the letter of the law, but use the spirit of the law. So Allah in the Quran is using, is saying both of them. You have people who are indigenous, people who, are, who stay in the same land, and people who are nomadic. So Allah gives you different alternatives for the same thing. He'll say, you can, if somebody hits you, you can hit them, or you can forgive them. So he's incorporating both what Musa said and what Isa alayhi salam said. So I think as human beings evolved and has and how experiences and circumstances changed, it was a necessity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to come in the time where men or human beings are at their peak of knowledge, at their peak of understanding, at their peak of probably being as inquisitive as ever. Generally speaking, you don't find people, I don't think in ancient times, who were atheists, people who didn't believe in God. So people now become becoming more inquisitive, more questioning morals. So I think that was the reason for it to be perfected as it, as it is. But from there, I'm sorry, did you, oh, I thought you, I thought you had a question. So on to uh, Tawheed. And when looking up Tawheed, even in non-Muslim sources, I like the words that they use. They said, uh, indivisible oneness is the conception of monotheism. As I said previously, monotheism, they group it in all different groups where people can believe in three gods that equal one. Or they believe in one god that, that they pray to, but other people have different gods. Tawheed is indivisible oneness. It is also uncompromising monotheism. These are the words that they use, meaning that there is nothing, there is no deviation or derivative of what we're saying. God is one, that's it. So there are different degrees and categories of Tawheed. <clears throat> so I, yeah, I did write those down here. But the different categories are in English is the unity of lordship, his name and attributes, and the unity of the worship of the law, the Tawheed of the worship of the law. So it's, in Islam, Tawheed, it's not merely monotheism. It's a belief in one unique God, but it's much more. Tawheed literally means unification or asserting oneness, and is derived from the word wahada, which means to be one, alone, unique, unparalleled, to be apart, and assert unity. And the definition of unity, or the legal definition of unity, is the quality or the state of not being multiplied, or the state of being one, single, whole, and the same. So when the term Tawheed is used in reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so the Tawheed of Tawheed Allah, it means the realization and, man, and maintaining of Allah's unity in all of man's actions which is directly or indirectly related to him. So it is the belief that Allah is one without partners, partners in his dominion or in his action. This is Wububiya. It's Tawheed Wububiya. Then there's a Tawheed of his, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his uh, attributes and his names, which is one without similitude in his essence and attributes. 
and then there is one without rivals in his divinity and in his worship. These three aspects form the basis for the categories into which the science of Tahid inseparable. So you can't have one without the other. The omission of one would lead one to shirk. And I think the other thing that kind of corresponds with the question that you asked is that because we have this science of Tawheed or the, the reason we have this science of Tawheed and why it's broken down in the way it is is because people have deviated from the truth of Al-Islam or the truth of the oneness of Allah. So we have to break it down in degrees so people can understand it because if there's three, even of the three degrees, there are three, there are elements that are broken down in those of you if you make a mistake and mess up one of them, you are in, in, in fact committing shirk. Like we mentioned uh, last week about the degrees of shirk. I'm sorry, you had a question? Yes, I just didn't know, I don't want to mess up your train of thought. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all right to ask a question, mm -hmm. but really my question is what comes to my mind based on my years of study, like the oneness of the law. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when we see Man worships so many gods. Based on what I read, man worship had so many gods. We say the one is of Allah. But not that Allah is one. Because based on what I read, we cannot put Allah in a category. So if I say Allah is one, I will be categor categorizing Allah. If I say Allah is one. And you say Allah is one and more. So I go with the more because, say for instance, if I look at the number one. One, and I think you use the word derivative. One is a derivative or a manifestation. If I was to use something, it would be more like the zero. Or because, well, and not necessarily zero, but uh, the oneness is, for me, is like what you said, all of us believe in the same thing. All of us being on the same page in the unification. But to actually say Allah is one, in terms of what that really means, it's still like I'm uh, putting a, a number or something on the law because the law is infinite. Well, I mean, you understand what I'm trying to But you can that. have one infinite. You can't have two infinite. So it can't, it, Allah says he is one. He's two different words to describe his oneness. It's one in Wahid, which means his, he's the, the source of all things. Okay. And he is one as he is one and only. It's nothing else like him. Okay, okay. But it is important to say that he is one because the prophets were articulating that he is one and alone. Right. But I'm talking about like, see, uh, like if I count one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five, six, seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. then it goes to the zero, right? The zero is nothing. Right. I mean, okay, the zero is nothing, but then you go one. But one is... I mean, so so this, this is, that's what I'm saying. It's two different words for this. So there's one, which means a succession, one, two, three. Right. It's, Allah uses that word for himself, but he also uses a head, a, a head which means he's one and only. Okay. So he used both of them. He's okay. saying, I'm one as the source of all things. Right. Everything comes from me, but also as there's nothing else like me at all. Okay, that's So is there a numerical value? I think that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Is there a numerical value? I think that's what he's asking. Like, um, and I think you just said that, but I just want to clarify. Mm -hmm. When we say the law is one, is that a numerical value? Or is that just one as in a whole? If that makes any sense. I'm trying to figure out, trying to make clear this mm -hmm. question. I don't know the difference of what you're saying is one as in there's no other one aside from him. Um, if you say two, then you could you would be making a derivative. Mm -hmm. For example, if you say there's two, there's no such thing as like two infinite. So let's say it's one being that can take up all of this place here. But if it's a second one, then you have to give him form and say he stops right here, and then the second one starts right here. So the that you're saying that he is one does not stop his his infinite wisdom, his infinite knowledge, his infinite power, or his any of his attributes because because we don't say it's a second one. If there was a second one, then there would be the limitations of that. that do you, I mean, at least that's how I see it. At least how I understand uh, it. Do you have uh, a question? Uh, on? But yeah. look, I heard you say that, that the zero is nothing. Mm -hmm. But how can a zero be nothing if it occupies a space? And, and something continues. And something the definition is one. I mean, if you draw one, then that occupies space. But the definition is zero, meaning nothing. So a law is not nothing. It's not nothing. 
But well, it occupies the space, though. But you got to understand that uh, the, the common system is man-made. Mm -hmm. We, 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 uh, in our little mind, mm -hmm. compared to to a lot, um, um, uh, humans make mistakes. So zero is 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 came from us, and the numbering system came mm -hmm. from humans. So, so. With the from looking at or understanding the creation of looking towards the creator. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, um, maybe Sister Jeanette can, can shed some light, further light on it, on that. Can you? <laughs> there are, you know, our minds, yes, our minds are limited, our minds are yes. limited. And the best thing that you can do is understand it. And that love, he, 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 understand the words of Allah in his book. Okay? He uses numbers. He talks about a time before there was a creation, before there was a humanity. He talks about himself as Wahid and Ahad. So, I mean, stop trying to wrap your mind around something mm -hmm. that you cannot do. Just accept what Allah has said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think in response to the zero or the nothing, so in science they say before the universe existed it was nothing. But their nothing is talking about time and space. Right. What we understand or the material was nothing. Right. Not to suggest that Allah did not exist. So as, as we all are saying, I think in some degree that we have limitations to understand what that is. But what we can understand from our limitation is that there is no other being like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Which means... In, in our words, is one of them. That's it. He's a thumb. <laughs> yes. So the um, the Tawheed al rububiyah means meaning maintaining the unity of the Lordship. This category is based on the fundamental concept that Allah alone causes all things to exist when there was nothing. He sustains and maintains creation without any need for it, from it or for it. And he is the sole Lord of the universe and its inhabitants, without any challenge to his sovereignty. According to this category, since God is the only real power in existence, it is he who gave all things the power to move and to change. Nothing happens in creation except that he allows it to happen. In recognition of this reality, Prophet Muhammad used to say, there is no movement nor power except by Allah's will. The basis for this concept can be found in many Quranic verses, particularly when Allah says, Allah creates all things and he is the agent of which all things depend. Another ayah says, and Allah created you all and whatever you do. Another, another ayah says, and no calamity strikes except by Allah's permission. So the second, Tawheed al-Asma wa Safat, meaning maintaining the unity of Allah's names and attributes. Now this has five different um, points that need to be made about this uh, one, I guess, category of Tawheed. For the unity of Allah's names and attributes to be maintained, Allah must be referred to according to how he and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has described him without explaining away his names and attributes by giving them meanings other than their obvious meanings. With similarities between man's attributes and those of man, with God's attributes and those of mankind is only in name and not in degree. When his attributes are used in, when attributes are used in reference to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are to be taken as in the absolute sense, free from human deficiencies. So if one said that they are strong, they are not strong in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is strong. He is absolute strength. If one says that he is wise, Allah is the wise. So it's only in the name that we can say it, but not in the degree of the power or the excellence by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So if we talk about a human being is compassionate, their compassion pales in comparison to the, passion, the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what we're saying here. And if you 
make a derivative of that or you suggest that somebody is as compassionate as Allah is when you are violating this form of Tawheed. The second aspect involves uh, referring to Allah as he refers to himself without giving him any new names or attributes. As we were mentioning previously, as a finite human being, it is in no, we are in no position to define the Lord who is infinite. So we use the attributes that he gave us to describe him. For example, it is claimed in the Bible or the Torah, or the Jewish Torah, that Allah spent the first day, the first six days creating, and then on the seventh day, he rested. Now we know in the Quran, Allah says, <laughs> it says that uh, no sleep or slumber can seize him and he doesn't feel any fatigue. So there have been people who suggested when they said that he rested, that meant that he stopped. But in Exodus, it references it again and it says, he rest and he was refreshed. So it meant that he rested he he, but, from labor. Yes. Yeah, but see, they're giving a lot of uh, human attributes. Certainly. So Certainly. when you give him human attributes, then you're talking about saying that he's human. Mm -hmm. For he sure. has no human attributes. Mm -hmm. But what, what probably happened is someone had the actual tour, or was told the actual right. tour and added this, let me say that he was he rested so on this day that we all rest. You know, we don't have a day of Sabbath where we right. just rest. rest. Um, so another instance is when uh, several times in the Bible it says Allah repented. He had bad thoughts, he made bad decisions, so he repented. And human beings, in many instances, um, according to the Bible, said, I mean, convinced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he, was made, that he made the right decision. This is something that is foreign to Al-Islam and foreign to uh, any reasoning person in thinking about the supreme being that a, one of his creatures was able to counsel him. Another thing that um, is mentioned is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already called God a spirit or that he has a spirit. Now this is something that I didn't, I didn't know a lot about until relatively recently. You know, I never thought about it until someone had mentioned it to me that Allah doesn't have a spirit. It says, um, similarly, the claim that God is a spirit or has a spirit completely ruins the area of Tawheed. Allah does not refer to himself as a spirit anywhere in the Quran, nor does his prophet Muhammad وسلم, express anything of that nature in Hadith. In fact, Allah refers to the spirit as the part of his creation. So to suggest that he is a spirit or he has a spirit would be in violation of this uh, understanding of Tawheed. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the Bible it says, Jesus says that you worship God in truth and in spirit. And because Christianity is such a prevalent religion, you hear that and you think about it without thinking of the, whether that makes sense or the correction of that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not call himself a spirit, which be, would be a correction of what it said previously in the same way he doesn't call himself father you would see that as his omission is the correction. And the key principle which show by uh, following deals with Allah's attributes as a Quranic formula when it says there is nothing like him or nothing comparable to him. <clears throat> the fourth aspect of this uh, form of Tawheed or this category of Tawheed is to not give man attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the same way in the Bible God is called, or Jesus, it's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's a man named Melchizedek who is uh, given attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He starts in Genesis and then you find him later, I think it's in the book of Hebrews. In Genesis, it reads that he has no mother, no father, no genealogy. He has no beginning and no ending. This is shirk. This is a violation of Tawheed. For example, if you believe that all the other aspects of what I have mentioned, but then you say this man has no beginning or no ending or believe it, as people who believe in the Bible do, then this is a form of shirk, this is a form of, the, of violating this understanding of Tawheed. The other thing is to give name, give humans Allah's name. There was a person who I know said, who named himself Al-Haq or Al-Hakim. I said, brother, you can't be the wise. <laughs> Only Allah is the wise. You can be Hakim, but you can't be Al-Hakim. Um, so giving people names 
that are strictly given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we mentioned previously, you can have um, a part, or you can have some understanding of wisdom, of compassion, but you, Allah is the totality of it, the absolute of that. So you can't say you are the wise, or you are the strongest, the mighty, all of those things. You can be a servant of Hakim, you can be a servant of Allah, you can be a servant of the mighty or of the wise, but you can't be Al Hakim. Abdul, um, Abdul Hakim. Abdul Hakim. But you also cannot be Abdul Rasul or Abu, or Abu mm -hmm. Nabi. You can't be the servant of the messenger or the <laughs> servant of the prophet. You're a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or using any of those 99 names. As uh, my teacher told me, there's more than 99 names, but 99 names is uh, what is popular. But there, there are other names in the Quran pertaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last category is the Tawheed or the maintaining the unity of Allah's worship. Now, in spite of the wide implications of the first two categories of Tawheed, firm belief in them alone is not sufficient to fulfill the Islamic requirements of Tawheed. They must be accompanied by worship. In order for Tawheed to be considered complete according to Al-Islam, this point is substantiated by the fact that Allah himself has related clearly in the Quran that the mushriks of the Prophet's time confirmed many aspects of the first two forms of Tawheed, but they did not accept or did, they did violate the third form. So in the Quran, Allah tells the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the, say to the pagans, Say, who is it that you give all your sustenance from this? Who is it that gives you sustenance from the sky and earth? Governs sight and hearing, brings forth light from the dead, and brings death from the living, and partners the affairs of man. And they will say, Again, uh, Allah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking to the pagans, and they acknowledge that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the one who gives them life and uh, brings life from the dead, yet they still associate partners with him and they worship others besides Allah. If, in another ayah, it says, if you ask them who created them, they will say Allah. Another instance in the Quran, it says, if you ask them who brings forth water from the sky and then brings the earth to life after death, they will most surely say Allah. So the pagan Meccans all knew that Allah was the creator, the sustainer, the Lord and master, yet the knowledge did not make, the Muslims, make them Muslims according to this understanding of Tawheed and according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, Allah says most of them do not believe in Allah except while joining partners with him. So the most important aspect of Tawheed is this Tawheed al-Ibadah, maintaining the unity of Allah's worship. All forms of worship may be, must be directed only to Allah because he alone desires or deserves worship. It is he alone who can grant benefit to man as a result of his worship. Furthermore, there is no need for any form of intercession or intermediates between God and Allah. Allah emphasizes the importance of directing worship to him alone by pointing out that this was the main purpose of his creation and the essence of the message brought to all prophets. Allah says, I did create jinn and man except but to worship me. Or I did not create jinn and man except but to worship me. In another instance it says, you only do we worship and from we say this, as a matter of fact, every day, at least 17 times a day, you alone do we worship, and from you alone do we seek refuge. So, our worship is supposed to be towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of those things, it's I always like al-Islam in the sense that you can say something, but it's the actions is what's, what really speaks. When you say you love Allah, or you fear Allah, if you love Allah, if you have God consciousness, if you have some care for Allah, what Allah wants you to do, it will be manifest in your works. So here, if we seek Allah's help, then we would ask Allah for this, for, uh, for worship and for guidance, which is what we are to do every day of our lives, five times a day of our, of our life. So from that last week, we, were, we mentioned a little bit about shirk. So there is two forms of shirk. The shirk that is the greater shirk, uh, and the other one which is lesser. So shirk means associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It comes from the word sharika, meaning companion, to be a sharer, or to be a partner. All of those words sound nice, and they are nice, except for when you are associating 
This with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are giving him partners, giving him associates, the danger in that is that you go, when you don't understand the lawgiver or you make the lawgiver the wrong person, then you will ultimately follow the wrong laws and follow the wrong rules. And the greater shirk, which is relatively uh, straightforward, I didn't want to go through all of that. Um, by the way, this is from um, most of the, the Tawheed. It's from um, Bilal Phillips. Uh, he did a really good job with this. I'm going to um, buy the book um, that he has here because it's pretty interesting. Yes, sir. Um, speak on shirk. Mm -hmm. Shirk being associating partners with Allah. It's not with Allah. Would the worship of Jesus or Farah Muhammad, would that be considered shirk? Like, they substitute, mm -hmm. they substitute, they believe, they say they believe in one God, but they substitute a human being mm -hmm. for, for, for one God. Is that considered necessarily a definition of shirk? In my, in my understanding, it does because they still have two different they have a duality that they are thinking of. They're still associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They believe in a supreme God that does everything, and this God is true, and then they're adding this other person to it. So that's still associating partners with him. Whether they're doing it intentionally or unintentionally, the man, Jesus, or the man, Farah Muhammad, is, is an entity within himself, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an entity within himself. So if you worship that man, you are associating him with the actual creator. So that, that is a, a form of shirk. The, so all of the things that I mentioned previously, violating those things, which is in terms of um, using names for Allah or giving human beings Allah's names is, is, is a form of shirk, associating partners with him, having saying that he has sons or daughters, um, saying that a man is G Jesus is God, all of those things would be the greater shirk. The lesser one, is hidden polytheism as we were mentioning last week a person commits hidden polytheism when he says tawhid but his thoughts and actions do not reflect his belief prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi said one who offers the ritual prayer in an ostentatious way is a polytheist one who keeps the fast and gives alms and performs hajj to show the public his righteousness or to earn good, a good name is a polytheist the word uses ar aria. It is showing off, basically. Uh, a word used for showing off or is a seeking a station, being high in people's minds and hearts with actions so that they may see you or to seek the praise of people. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said, has said the, fear, the thing I fear the most is as shirk as aghar, which meaning the lesser shirk. And the companion asked him, O Messenger of Allah, what is that? And he replied, Ariya. For, for verily Allah will say on the day of resurrection, when people are receiving their rewards, go to those who you are showing off to in the material world and see if you can find any reward from them. In another instance, Allah subhanahu wa, I mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, well, we mention from the Quran, we say, as I said previously, it is you we worship, it is you that we seek. So this is the cure for this disease in having or wanting to show off in front of other people. In another instance, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh my people, beware of secret shirk. And the people said, Oh Messenger of Allah, what is secret shirk? And he replied, When a man gets up to pray and strives to beautify his prayer because people are looking at him, this is secret shirk. So again, wanting to show off in front of other people, doing, performing the rituals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for you to please mankind, not to please him. So one quote of Allah may, I mean, one quote of Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was to know God is to know his oneness. In the Quran it says, only those who possess knowledge are the ones who are truly in awe of Allah. So that you understand God and you understand his oneness and you understand his might, his power, his attributes, that he is the creator, the sustainer, that he is the compassionate, that he is the forgiving, and you understand that those are absolutes, is when you are truly in awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just thinking about, so we understand him from his attributes and from his creation, 
and his relation to creation. I remember I was reading on um, the universe and the stars and the moon and all those things. And one day I just came, I, mean, I was coming out of my house and I was just looking up at those things. And I was not in awe of those things, but in awe of the creator of those things. And I was just sitting and watching. And then one of my sons to me said, what you doing? And then my son here in Nasir said, he's just um, in awe of, of the creator of the universe. It was very, um, I don't know, telling. I, was, I didn't say any words, but he knew that that's what I was doing. And I, I was just in awe. When you see things, I saw a video the other day of a tornado, or the starting of a tornado, and then it, then it went away. But the clouds that are spinning, looking like a, I don't know, like a, a knife in the air. I mean, you just think of how powerful that is and what the, the damage that it can cause. And then you think about the creator who created everything in this universe and clouds which you can fly through, but they can also tear down a building in a matter of seconds. You know, it's, it's very awe-inspiring to think of the creator of something, of, of a being that can create something that, that way. But at any rate, the other thing that I wasn't mentioned, or at least not mentioned in the uh, research that I was doing, was on when Allah says that they take lords and patrons besides Allah, uh, rabbis and monks. And he also mentions the Messiah, son of Mary, when they are bidden to worship Allah only. There is no God save him, but he be he glorified from what they ascribe to him. So not only are you not to put um, other gods in this place, but other people that you see as um, knowledgeable, other people that you see as pious people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his words supersede everyone, every other person's words. So if they're not saying something in accordance to it, then, they, then you are putting that person in the place of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the other thing that I thought was mentioned that I, I think is a form of shirk that wasn't in the research is when Allah, I was reading just recently about the battles, right? So when, the, uh, when Allah tells people to fight, and Allah says, but then when fighting is ordained for them, a party of them fear men as they fear Allah or even greater. <laughs> so th this verse, it says one thing, that is a degree that you fear Allah, but it, you should not exceed the degree in fear in Allah where you are incapacitated or you're unable to do anything. So the fear of Allah is also in correspondence to the love of Allah in that you are in awe of him. Not necessarily that you're scared he's going to do something to you, but you're in awe of his power. But at any rate, it's saying you are in, you're scared of man more than you're scared of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in doing so, then this is also a form of shirk in that you're putting, um, that you don't have enough faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're afraid of human beings. So, I think, oh, the, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, I have this other book called Islam, The Natural Way of Life. And in it, the guy describes uh, the creator and how we can, just from our rational thinking and our observation of creation, how we can come to this determination that Allah is one and that all, of, all of his attributes are absolute. And he begins with, the creator must be a different must be of a different nature from all that he has created. This is because if he was of the same nature, then he have, would have a beginning in time. And therefore, he would need a maker. So if he, in order for him to be the creator, to be the first cause, he had to not have a cause. If the creator is not temporal, he must be eternal. And or the word we use is samad, absolute, having no beginning. If he is eternal, then he cannot be caused. If nothing causes him to exist, nothing causes him to continue to exist, which means that he is also self-sufficient. If he is self-sufficient, then he has no ending. The creator is therefore eternal and everlasting. So he has no beginning or ending. If he is eternal and everlasting, all of his attributes must also be eternal and everlasting. This means if he is powerful, then he has always been powerful and he always will be powerful. He cannot cease to be powerful. He is all, if he is all-knowing, then he is always will be all-knowing. If he is kind and just, then he has always been and all will, always will be kind and just. In the Quran, it mentions what is called the Sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
It says, you will never find in the way of Allah any change, and you will never find in the way of Allah any alterations. So he will always be the way that he is. If he has, in the same circumstances, if he judges someone, you know how this judgment will be. So the creator does not lose or gain any of his quality or attributes. They are all absolute attributes. So his power is absolute power. This precludes the existence of a second. There cannot be an absolute, two absolute powers. Absolute means unconditional and total. If power is shared, it is not unconditional or total. And therefore, in the same way, there cannot be two infinite beings. There can only be one. So as I mentioned previously in the Quran, Allah uses the words Ahad and Wahid uh, as descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying he is one and that he is single. <clears throat> so Wahid means cardinal number one or single. Wahid means, and this is from the Quranic dictionary, Wahid means the first or the starting point. It requires a second or third to follow it. Wahid shows that God is the real source from which all creation springs and everything points back to him as just as a second and third thing points back to the first. In this instance, the creator points to the, cre the creation, points to the creator. The effect points to the cause, and the system points to the system maker. Ahead, ahead means he is he who is and has always been one and alone, unmatched. Ahead denotes the absolute unity of God without relating to any other being. Where Allah seeks to refute the doctrine of sonship, Allah uses this word ahead in the Quran. So I was talking to someone the other day who said that um, someone asked him, does he believe in God? And he said, there is no greater being than ourselves. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> I felt it was, he's somebody that's a uh, close friend of mine, so I thought it was necessary for me, for me to talk to him, mm -hmm. like, in person, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I asked him to explain what he meant by this. And I was telling him that there is a creator, right? There is a being that is supreme to you. I said, first I said, when you are on your deathbed, who, are you going to ask yourself to heal yourself or yourself to... Um, show some mercy on you, and he didn't have a real response to that. So I asked him about the creation of this earth, or the creation of the universe. And uh, initially he started off with a single cell organism, then it turned into a multi-cell organism, then it turned into an animal, and, there, and therefore. And I said, and then he started going into the universe, and I said, listen, I can stop you right now, or I'll let you keep talking. <laughs> I said, because what I'm going to say to you is, what happened right before that, <laughs> right? So whatever you say, I'm gonna, because he started talking about gases, and they, they created the planets and all that. I said, I'm gonna ask you, what happened right before that? So you can, you can waste time and say all of that, or we can go right to what I'm saying. I said, there was nothing, according to science, there was no thing, no time, no space, and then it came into existence. The being that caused nothing to turn into something is the supreme being. I asked him, <laughs> what is the difference between one and nothing? You know what the difference is? It is infinite. If there's no things, first of all, you can't, we can't have nothing. It's impossible. <laughs> Even if you tried to bottle up nothing, you couldn't do it. <laughs> you couldn't bottle up air or whatever the microscopic organisms that are inside of it. So as he said he was a supreme being, I said you can gather all the people who agree with you and they wouldn't be able to make one thing. So they are not the supreme beings. What, he's, what they are really trying to do is really have like a play on words. They're saying that they are the supreme human beings. Mm -hmm. in, another, in, a, in a way to say that, a way to say that other people came from them. But they're still using the word supreme being. And in doing so, they're deceiving people as if they are gods themselves and human beings are gods themselves. And they're promoting some form of racism. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, when we, um, when we talked about that, you know, my years of studying that concept, what we were really saying was that there was, that there was no supreme being, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, the, that the 
accumulation of the entire universe was embodied within man. Mm -hmm. That's really what we were saying, that all of the elements that it took to make the universe be found inside of the human being's me mechanism. Yes. So we, what we were doing was redefining what people thought God was, mm -hmm. right? So the idea that there was a supreme being outside of the physicality of existence, mm -hmm. we were essentially saying that that didn't exist, that that was a spook, and that <clears throat> the, only, the closest thing that you would get to that is what you're looking, to, looking at in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So it was a redefining of um, what we thought the, what we thought creation was, and that 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 initial spark into existence, that initial spark into existence, that the vision of cells and the gases and blase blase can be re replicated when you look inside of the womb, mm -hmm. like the creation of the universe. Mm -hmm. You can right. see inside, inside of the womb, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So. That that's essentially what we were saying. That that what you that we believe mm -hmm. today doesn't exist. So before you before uh, <laughs> unless you wanna you gonna say something about what he said? Yeah. Alright, go ahead, because I was I don't Yes, because mm -hmm. the creator. Mm -hmm. And when you say spring being, mm -hmm. you give God a human quality. So if you separate create shine from uh creator you get a better understanding of who the creator is and who creation is. Creation has an expiration date. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And then creator doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, and I tell a lot of Christians this, that, that, that uh, if you take that concept, then you can separate human beings from the, from the creator. Creator is a creator of human beings. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not male or female. Mm -hmm. He's a creator of male and female. Mm -hmm. So, you know, giving him a, uh, uh, saying a uh, supreme being, I wouldn't, I would even, you give him God human uh, qualities when you say supreme being. And, and like I said, if you, if you separate creator from creation, you get a better understanding of who creator is. Creator. But when they're saying supreme being, they mean supreme human being, but they don't take, put human in there. But when you say it's being, yes. you mean something that is alive, something that is living, and Allah is alive and living, so you can use that word, but it's still, people still have in their minds, some people may still use it to say a human being. Mm -hmm. But like you were saying, there is a beginning and an ending, right? Um, the, the, in order for this universe to exist, in order for us to be where we had, we have to have a beginning. And I told him this also, I said, what you're believing, so I asked him, do you um, believe that this universe created itself or it just started on its own? And he said, yes. I said, yes. <laughs> yeah. I said you are believing, because first of all, this person is not as um, theologically literally, yes. and literate as you are at right. all. He's right. just saying what somebody told him told to say, him. and he thought this yeah. sounds good to say. Right. So I said, what you are, and he's, he's anti-religious. I said, what you just did was create a religion yeah. that's completely unscientific. Right. I said, you have to believe that because it does, not, it does not correspond with science because it is an effect that has no cause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's impossible for it to happen. Right. You, you, you're saying an effect happened, an explosion happened. First, there was nothing, and then something came into existence. I said, if we sit here, would you wait for a horse to come in the middle of this place, mm -hmm. or a turkey, or a cow, or anything, just waiting for it in the pop into existence. So for one that is unscientific, the second part is there is it's an effect without a cause. And then it, it and and the reason that I, t I tell him this, I said, because God is not my belief. I know it's a, it's a necessity for him to exist. So it has to exist. So ultimately when I left them, I said, listen, I told you that I had never met an atheist. And when I do, when I leave, they don't be an atheist. You are not you just want to say this, but it's yeah. not what you really believe. Because when I ask you questions, you start realizing what I'm saying makes sense, and what you say it does not. <laughs> but uh, one thing I wanted to end with is one last thing is with this I had is that I was reading something about um, Bilal. May Allah be pleased with him. So we all know, or maybe we know about Bilal, and he was a slave, and his slave master wanted him to renounce Al Islam, wanted him to renounce Allah. And they put a, they tortured him. They put a rope around his neck, carried him throughout the uh, town.
put the rock on his on his chest and was pressing on the rock for him to say to renounce Al Islam and for him to worship the God that they wanted him to worship. And he kept saying, Ahad, Ahadu, Ahad. So someone asked in uh, some form that I was looking at, some Muslim form, they said, he could have said any word. He could have said, La ilaha illallah, but he said, Ahad. Why did he choose that word? And it, the, the reason they said was because his slave master hated Ahad. He hated him saying <laughs> one and only. Because, and I was talking to my sons about this, um, some people don't like the provocativeness of, of what I say particularly like on social media, I say the words that are provocative and people make it upset. But I'm telling you, saying the truth upset people anyway. Yeah. When, Allah, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, La ilaha illallah, he is saying, all the 360 gods you worship are not real. There's one Allah. So they're all pissed off. It's, but whose fault is it that he's telling them the truth and you believe something that is not true? So Bilal was basically saying, I know y'all gonna torture me. <laughs> Go ahead with it. Do what you're gonna do. I'm gonna keep saying I had. You know, now what? You know that that's so instead of saying la ilaha illa, la ilaha illallah, he understood that. He knew that, but the, the slave master was more mad that he kept saying he is one and only. You know, you know, so just just that was something that you know kind of encapsulated how Muslims should be about this oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, sir. And, and you know when I had my hand up it, it's ironic that that's what I was going to say. <laughs> the Quran says, Kudu Allah Hu Ahad. Mm -hmm. right? And in many Ramadans, I don't know what the Arabia says, but in many Ramadans, while reading the Quran, while it also says, say he Allah is one, it also clearly says that Allah is incomprehensible. Yes. Yes. It says, say he Allah is one, mm -hmm. but it also says Allah is incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's what we didn't understand. Yeah. See that, and that's and I, and I figured that out. Yeah. And I, that's what brought me right. to Islam because, in our attempt to remove God from the equation, we were essentially saying that we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. right? right? That's that's essentially when you get down to the nitty gritty of it. Mm -hmm. We were saying, in doubt, do it out. Mm -hmm. But we wasn't willing to accept that we to accept that. Right? We mm -hmm. wasn't to accept that we didn't understand. So we began to make up our our own idea of what. Would, we thought God was, and that was self, right? Mm -hmm. we can't, so we can't figure this out, so mm -hmm. we're just going to do away with it, and we're just going to accept ourselves as what we think this is, right? And, and when coming into that realization that um, that was my, that was my, you know, I guess you could say my coming to was, you know what, I don't, I don't truly, my, my finite mind, I cannot encapsulate what is the creator. Mm -hmm. My... And, that, and I think that's what submission to the word of Allah comes to is the, you know, having faith that, you know, God will put you on the right path, mm -hmm. right? That, you know, I'm going to accept God for who God says he is, right. not what I want to say God is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, you know, we come to terms with, you know, with Tawheed with, with and, and, mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the Bible was saying, you know, God being incomprehensible. Right. And stuff. You have to accept that. Now, you really can't be a Muslim if you don't accept that. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, yeah, for sure, there's... Like you said, we're fine. Our, our, our minds can only ex understand but so, so much. much. Yes. Um, I'm gonna send you a video of somebody <laughs> that it, um, that I think will um, explain this perfectly. I'm gonna try to see. Let me see if I can explain some of it. His name is uh, Gary Miller. He's, um, he changed his name to Umar Abdullah Had, and he's talking about um, Goodell's theory. And what it says is if you you have first you start off with um, an, you start off with an assumption and our assumption is that the universe makes sense mm -hmm. and he says that's equivalent to saying la ilaha illallah like that there is no god but Allah and he said if you understand like creation then you understand that there is one unknowable variable in this creation and that unknowable variable is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the only way we know of him is from his attributes and how they relate to our creation and he was saying that this man Goodell was using the theory to say to actually prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whether he was doing it uh, intentionally or unintentionally he was saying if you know the variable if you understand the system you understand it there's always something outside of the system that you don't have full knowledge of Yes, uh, right. uh, and that's one reason all all the discussions that we've had um, now um, that's the reason why we need God's guidance. Mm -hmm. 
in the in the in the in Fati how we begging God for mm -hmm. guidance. You know, we beg God for guidance. And we can't come to the conclusion that we count to in, in this circle without God's guidance. Yes, sir. And 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 going back to uh, what you said about um, uh, uh, God's spirit uh, or his breath when he breathed into mm -hmm. man, uh, a lot of people think, and this is from the Imam Muhammad, um, sitting under him and reading some of his material, he said God's breath is not the, the, the physical breath, because mm -hmm. we can't take the, the winds from tornadoes <laughs> or hurricanes. Let's see. Let's see. Okay, yeah. just think imagine God's breath. Mm -hmm. You know, if he whew, mm -hmm. blew his breath into us. But the man said God's breath is his signs uh, and ayats, mm -hmm. his signs, and, and our understanding of his signs, God's guidance for us to understand those signs. That's his breath. Also gives us life. Yes, right? that's what gives you <laughs> I definitely yeah. understand the yes. uh, analogy in that for yeah. sure. Um, well, with that said, that's all I had about Tahib. But I did want to mention that. Uh, I'm sorry, you had a question? That's not a question. I just wanted to say, you know, the root of the, of the word roh, which mm -hmm. is the one of the So, one thing I want to mention about that, so I think when people saw that it said he rested on, on the seventh day, uh, rabbis and maybe Christians realized the implications of it, and they said it wasn't rest, but that he completed his work. But that it was something that is written by the hands of love, I mean, stop the love, something written by the hands of man is why it betrays them. And that, as I said previous, as I said earlier, that in this couple, in the next chapter, it says he rested and was refreshed, meaning that he was, he did rest, and then he, re, and he regained his strength. So this is that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying that he did, he feels no fatigue is in response to that, at least in my in my view. Um, when the brother was talking about. Um, the totality of the universe is inside of humanity. This is still, you know, you know, it is 
um, stars that implode is what makes the, the, the body of human beings, but it doesn't make the soul of human beings. Like you can, if you build up a human being, it won't make them into a person. What is the true person or the true self is that inanimate, that immaterial thing that is inside of you, that is your soul, that Allah, that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the physical world. Um, so even with that said, that the universe, that we are the understanding of the communication back with the universe, as he said, the universe is still has a beginning and it has an ending. In fact, they found that um, protons and atoms are decaying, which means they're ultimately coming to an end. And if they had a beginning, if they were non-existent and they have an existence, then they had a beginning and an ending. Uh, so ultimately, they do need a creator. Um, what about the uh, the day of rest? What where is it? I want to look that up now. I mean, what is it? Is it pertaining to any day specific? Is it a specific day or a day of our choosing? Um, you know, like for the for the Jews and the Christians, it was a specific day, mm -hmm. and they they were not allowed to do physical things on that day. Mm -hmm. The ones who did, they were punished. You know, the story of the fish, like the fish mm -hmm. would come on the other Sabbath, and they didn't mm -hmm. come on the other days, but they weren't supposed to fish on the other Sabbath. Right. That was a rule. They did. Now, just thinking about that, right? It, this, you know, the Sabbath was established in the Jewish Torah, and Isa alayhi salam, or Jesus, was talking to him about this day of the Sabbath, right? Um, he says, if your goat or sheep falls in a hole and it's a day mm -hmm. of Sabbath, are you going to get them out? This is what, this is, because we were talking, he was, uh, the brothers asking me about why Allah perfected Al Islam with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Isa was clarifying or abrogating what they had believed in previously. He's saying, don't take the letter of the law so strictly. If you're if you are hungry, and or if you if you have, a, he he said that the what did he say? He said you are the law. You are the Lord of these um, of the Sabbath, not the Sabbath of the Lord over you. In other words, like use your own common sense. If you have, if you're walking down the street and your sheep falls in a hole. It's the Sabbath. You don't let them die in the hole. You get them out, you know, because it's the Sabbath. So he was telling them, don't take the letter of the law so strictly. Use the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law says then that you should rest on this day, but not that you should never do anything because that just doesn't make sense. So it seems almost like an evolution of what you were saying in that you choose the day and don't make it something so strict that everybody on this Saturday, they won't do anything. They'll let things just go and because they the, the the situation was, I think that the disciples were eating on that day, and they were like, oh, what are they doing eating or hunting for food on the day of the Sabbath? It's like, if you're hungry, you're going to not find food you know, on the day of the Sabbath. It's, it's not common sense to do what he was saying. So uh, even in that, the evolution of it is that Allah gives you the, the freedom to choose the day that you want to rest and the time you want to rest. It's not something that is obligatory for every single person to rest on Sunday and not do anything because people were taking it too strictly. Mm -hmm. um, which is Saturday. It's not Saturday. Saturday. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Saturday. Yeah. And, I, and you find, I've, I, I've met African American Christians who grew up that way. Yeah. Uh, I have too. They would yeah. not do anything right. on Saturday. So right. you cooked all your food on Friday. Right. And you prepared everything on Friday so that on Saturday you did not do those type of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, your house was clean before that day came. So you didn't have to. So you did. but, but again, you, you weren't crazy. You didn't, you know, like, <laughs> not wash your dishes or whatever. You know, it wasn't like you couldn't do anything, but you just tried to prepare so that you could focus. And they had to read the Bible and pray mm -hmm. and study on that day. Mm -hmm. So now, because we know they like that was given to us, but yet we have mm -hmm. to pray five times a day. Mm -hmm. right. So we're supposed to be doing some of that every day to pull ourselves away from the physical into the spiritual. So that I think when you would add it up, they would, our worship, in a, in a week is going to come to a set. Mm -hmm. It's like the equivalent of a set. Turn it away everything you do, particularly even on Juma and all of those 
connection together would be like a, a, a sabbatical. Um, you know, I don't know if you you, you met Sister Kadisti that used to, yeah, she's uh, in Ethiopia right now, and she's talking about, uh, she said she wanted to talk to me about the extreme difference of Christianity practice in Ethiopia and in practice here. Yeah, yeah, they find, yeah. they have times when they pray, right. they have times, every, I mean, they have things that are in, in a correlation with Al Islam. Yeah. And she um, was telling me about something she had learned about, you know, the, um, mm -hmm. the, the hijra. So she wanted to talk about that. So she didn't really go into detail about it, but she was saying, and she had told me previously that what the Christianity practice there is totally different from the Christianity practice here, mm -hmm. and that it is um, more structured, and, to say the least. All right, salam alaikum.